About 12 years ago, my wife and I attended LifeBridge for the first time, and we were in a place in, uh, in our ministry. We were pastors, and we were at a place in ministry where we had been kind of deeply hurt by church and by ministry, and, uh, and we just didn't know if we wanted to do it anymore. And so my wife is here with me. She's sitting right there. She's, we've been married in February. will be 29 years, and so I'm glad she's here with me. So that's her in the about fourth row in the black shirt. So don't, don't, if you're single, don't be like, hey, who's the new girl? Okay. Because <laughs> I, I compete in jujitsu tournaments and I will put you to sleep. All right. <laughs> just kidding. So about 12 years ago, we came here. We were kind of disoriented and disillusioned with ministry. And, and I met your pastor, uh, Pastor Rick, and he took an interest in me and my wife. And uh, I tell people it was like we were in a river and we were kind of tumbling and falling and getting hit in the rocks and going under. And he, he looked at me and he grabbed a hold of me and he pulled me out of the water. And for the next year, uh, he and I met about every other week. We would have breakfast at analysis at 630 in the morning. I don't know why he wanted to drive him from Greeley, 60, but, but it was worth it. And uh, and after a year, we started a church in Greeley called Mosaic, and there were eight of us in my kitchen. And that's when we started, and now there are between five and 600 people that worship with us on a weekend, and I give lots of thanks to your pastor for that. <laughs> Pastors are better together. Churches are better together. We're better together when we're working together instead of when we're competing with one another. There are a lot of things that are better together. Peanut butter and jelly are better together. <laughs> Warm cookies and milk are better together. Even if you're lactose intolerant, you're like, you know, it's worth it. I'll have one. You know what I mean? Like better. Chips are great. Salsa is great. But they are better together. If you and I went to eat and they put chips and salsa in front of us, in about three minutes, it's going to look like a crime scene. Like it's because they, chips and salsa. And I want to talk to you about as a community being better together. So if you'll do something, if you'll indulge me, do something that we do at my church, would you look at the person sitting next to you and just say, better together? Now, like I said, um, we started Mosaic about 11 years ago, and your pastor called me a couple months ago and asked me if I would speak on this very easy topic, right, racism, yeah, especially right now in our country, like, hey, yeah, great, let's do it. Uh, and I looked in my notes, I've preached about 500 times at my church, Mosaic, over the last 11 years, and I've never spoken on racial reconciliation or diversity or, or anything like that, which is, I thought that was odd because we have a very diverse church, and I, I speak at colleges around the country about racial diversity and ethnicity and all that, and I've never done it at my church. So I'm excited to be here talking about this, so let's go. This is Richard Rinaldi, and he's a New York photographer. He, uh, his specialty is he'll stop people on the street, strangers, and he'll ask him, can I take your picture? But then he does something kind of unusual to pose them. Uh, this is what he does. 46-year-old Richard Rinaldi is looking for someone. Two someones, actually. Two total strangers who were meant to be together. This is Dominic, right? If only for a moment. Okay, so you guys are gonna be a couple. They're not exactly sure what they've just signed up for. Actually. And people are a little nervous at first. Okay. I just need you a little closer, like, okay, good. Richard Actually, is a New York photographer working on a series of portraits. Okay, good. For each shot, he grabs strangers off the street, like Jenny Wood, an airline employee from Virginia, and Dominic Tucker, a college student from Brooklyn, and poses them okay. like adoring family. Um, beautiful, one, two, and three. Richard calls the project Touching Strangers. He started shooting it seven years ago and now has hundreds of portraits of these unlikely intimates. Some of the photos you'd never know they'd never met, while others capture quite well the inherent awkwardness of cuddling some random dude. Hey, nice to meet you. Even when the subjects seem eager, their body language often concedes a certain hesitance, at least at first. Oh, cool. Ten minutes later, though, it's like Thanksgiving at Aunt Margaret's. And that's the really weird thing. Oh, that's great. Yes, Richard puts the people in these poses, but the sentiment that seems to shine through is real. At least, so say the subjects. Okay. It was sort of awkward, but then sort of not. You guys did so good. We are probably missing so much about the people all around us. This is Reiko. At first, Brian Sneed, oh, Brian. a poetry teacher, okay. saw no Do rhyme or reason for back? posing with retired fashion designer yeah, yeah. Reiko Irvin. Can you just come in like a little more? Yeah, okay. But eventually, he too 
felt a change. I felt like I cared for her. Cared for her? Yeah, I felt like it brought down a lot of barriers. Pretty much everyone it was a good feeling. shared that same sentiment. <laughs> it was nice to feel that comfort. Everyone seems to have come away with kind of a good feeling. It's kind of lovely. It's lovely. Most photographers capture life as it is. But in these strangers, Richard Rinaldi has captured something much more ethereal and elusive. He shows us humanity as it could be, as most of us wish it would be, and as it was, at least for this one fleeting moment in time. Steve Hartman, On the Road, in New York. Isn't that beautiful? What I like about what Rinaldi does is he takes people that are on the surface opposites and he puts them together. This is a Hasidic, a Hasidic Jewish man and an African-American man, two ethnic opposites coming together. This one is my favorite. It's a little girl and, uh, with this older guy, young and old, black and white, uh, different levels of ability coming together even just for a moment. It's a beautiful picture. It's a beautiful picture of what could be. And so now sociologists, each of us have our preferred group that we feel most comfortable around. And so uh, sociologists call this grouping. We, we naturally gravitate towards people who look like us or, or maybe they, they vote like you or maybe they have the same interests as you or they come from the same places as you. So we call those our in-group. These are my, we say things like, these are my people. I feel familiar and comfortable around my people. And if someone's not one of your people, then then you're out group. They, they, maybe they don't look like you or maybe they don't vote like you or even speak your same language. And so for those people, we refer to them as those people. Have you ever said that before? You know those people, like those other people, right? And we all have those groups. It's not, it doesn't make you a bad person. It makes you a human person. But Paul addresses this in the book of Corinthians. This was happening inside the church, and so Paul wanted to talk about it. This is what he says, 1 Corinthians chapter 12. So we were all baptized by one spirit as to form one body. Whether Jews or Gentiles, slave or free, we were all given the one spirit to drink. I read a, a study this week and 83% of Americans believe that racism is a problem in our nation right now. 58% believe it is a serious problem. Satan has done a great job of dividing us. And uh, by the way, Satan is the enemy. It's not the black man. It's not the white man. It's not the brown man. It's not the immigrant. It's not the native. It's not the Republican. It's not the Democrat or any other kind of man. It is Satan. And what he's doing is he's doing his best to separate us. Because if you've ever been separated or categorized based on what you look like, then you know it creates a wound inside of you. Whether you'd like to admit it or not, you know that it hurts when you're segregated or kicked out or pushed out or excluded because of how you look. There's a Japanese art. It's called kintsugi. What they do is they take pottery, plates, or bowls that have been broken, and they repair them, but they don't repair them to hide the break. They repair them to highlight the break, and they fill in the break with 24 karat gold. The reason they do that is so they can show that something that has been repaired is now more beautiful and more valuable than it was before it was broken. And I really believe that God could do the same thing in northern Colorado with the divisions and the brokenness that has happened because of this whole racial conversation. Now, one of the most effective lies that the enemy likes to tell us is we are more different than we are the same. So a few of the strategies he uses to try and separate us, uh, one of them is external racism. External racism says, you look different than me, therefore you are bad. If you've ever felt separated by someone just because of the way they look, that doesn't make you a bad person. That makes you a normal person. But God is calling us to something higher. There's another form of racism. It's internal racism. It says, you are not as good as me. And if you hear that enough times, then you will start to say, I am not as good as you. This is Jane Elliott. In 1968, in her third grade classroom, she did an experiment. She took all of her students every one of the, uh, which was white, by the way, they were all the same ethnicity, and she said, we've got some new research. We've just found out that brown-eyed kids are smarter than blue-eyed kids. So she took all the brown-eyed kids and set them in the front of the classroom. She took all the blue-eyed kids and sat them in the back of the classroom. She put a collar around the blue-eyed kids so that the brown-eyed kids could identify them, and then for that day, she gave her very best energy, attention, teaching to the brown-eyed kids. And the blue-eyed kids she was short with, and she kind of ignored, and she pushed them away. 
And after one day of hearing, you're better, and after one day of hearing, you're worse, you're not as good, their test scores reflected that. After one day, the brown-eyed kids were scoring better and the blue-eyed kids were scoring worse. If you hear you're not good enough enough times, eventually you'll believe it. Then the next day she came in and she said, we made a mistake, we read the research wrong, and she flip-flopped the whole thing. She said, it turns out the blue-eyed kids are smarter, brown-eyed kids are worse. And after one day of hearing that, guess what their test scores did? They flip-flopped the other way. If someone tells you you're not good enough, eventually you'll believe it. The third kind of racism that the enemy loves to, to attack us with is institutional racism. It's when one group withholds access to basic amenities from another group. My dad is Mexican. He was born here in the United States, however, and uh, he was raised in South Texas. And in South Texas, uh, Texas, I didn't know this, but there have been 232 documented lynchings of Mexican-Americans in Texas alone, people that look just like me. My dad was raised in South Texas, and he was whipped in class for speaking Spanish. He was whipped in class for drinking out of the whites-only drinking fountain. He says when he was growing up, they would go to restaurants, and there would be signs on the, on the doors that say, we don't serve dogs or Mexicans. But he, he couldn't read in English very well, so he'd go in there, and he'd try and order. And they'd say, we don't serve Mexicans here. And he would say, that's okay. I don't want a Mexican. I just want a hamburger. <laughs> that was my dad's way of dealing with it. He would use humor. He'd laugh about it. I never saw him get upset about the way he was treated except one time when I was a little kid and we stopped to eat at a restaurant in Texas and they wouldn't serve us because we were Hispanic. Then my dad got upset. He said, I was raised like this. I'm not going to let my kids be raised like this. So I was raised here in Fort Lupton, a town of about 5,000 people. There was a lot of racial tension when I was growing up. The year before I was born, the police station was bombed uh, by some radicals, and, and there were marches. And so in my community, but my dad wouldn't let us, he didn't want us to learn Spanish because he wanted us to grow up and have access to English. So I was, I was that kid that was kind of stuck in the middle. I was too Mexican for the white kids and too white for the Mexican kids. They would call me a coconut. You know what a coconut is? It's brown on the outside, white on the inside. That hurt my feelings, right? That's, so when you're, if you've ever been treated like that, if you've ever felt like that, then what the enemy would love to do, uh, one of the tactics the enemy loves is he would love to make you choose a side. Are you on this side or this side? In this race conversation, are you on this side or this side? What do you, how do you feel about immigrants? What about that, that immigrant caravan moving right now? Are you on this side or this side? What about our government? Are you on this side or this side? What about the police? Are you on this side or this side? Uh, we started our church 11 years ago. For the first eight years, we were trying to find our own building, and we couldn't find one. We were renting. And I approached a number of churches, one of which was closing. I found out that they were, going, they were closing, and so I wrote some emails to their, their pastors and to their elders. I sent letters to the elders' homes and to the church, and I could never get any response at all. A couple years later, I, so we moved on. A couple years later, I'm having lunch with two pastors, one of which was the pastor that, of that church. And we're having lunch, and he says, Angel, uh, I owe you an apology. And I said, for what? Like, I don't even know you. What could you have possibly done to me? And he said, well, when you were reaching out to us and trying to get a hold of us about, about our building and you know, maybe working with us or renting from us, um, our elders, my elders wouldn't let me respond to you because they didn't want a, a Mexican church in our building. Now, this wasn't 50 years ago. This was three years ago. And this was inside the body of Christ. So I sat there with my mouth hanging open like I couldn't believe what he was telling me. And my first response was to that jujitsu thing I was telling you about, like, right? <laughs> So, but, you know, immediately I realized that's exactly what the enemy would like. He would love for us to respond in anger. And then I realized this man didn't have to tell me that. But he was doing his best to heal some of the wounds that his church had created. That's what God wants us to do. So there's that option. Are you on this side or this side? Pastor Miles McPherson pastors a large church in San Diego. I heard him speak not long ago about this very subject, and he, he introduces or presents a third option. He said it doesn't have to be this side or that side. There is a third option. He bases that off of a conversation that Joshua has with, the commander of, with an angel, the commander of the army of the Lord, in Joshua chapter 5. Joshua is getting ready to go attack Jericho, and this is what happens. Now, when Joshua was near Jericho, he looked up, and he saw a man standing in front of him with a drawn sword in his hand. Joshua went up to him and asked, are you for us? Or for our enemies. 
Doesn't that sound familiar? Are you on this side or this side? Are you with us or are you with them? Neither, he replied, but as commander of the army of the Lord, I have now come. Joshua's asking him, do you like our group better or do you like their group better? By the way, Jesus didn't come to take a side. He came to take over. He came to take over this whole conversation. That was good, angel. Say it again. All right, I will. <laughs> Jesus didn't come to take a side. He came to take over. That's what the body of Christ is all about. So when Joshua recognizes what's happening, this is his response. Then Joshua fell face down to the ground in reverence and asked him, what message does my Lord have for his servant? Joshua falls down. It's a, he, he assumes a humble posture. And he says, okay, God, I see that something different than what I'm understanding is happening right now. Teach me what you want me to do. And I think that that's what God is asking the church and each of us individually to do, to humble ourselves and to say, God, what do you want to teach us? And so Miles McPherson offers a few facets of the third option. I want to share a couple of them with you. The first one is honor the image of God that is present in every person we meet. The people in your in-group you love them because they look like you and they feel like you and you see easily the image of God in them. But the people in your out group, the people that you don't love, the people that you would not want to spend any time around, the image of God is present in them too. Genesis 127 says, so God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created the male and female. He created them. God is inviting us to even in the people we don't like to acknowledge the priceless value of his image in each of them. Even though we don't feel comfortable with those people, even though we don't feel familiar with those people, there is no us and them. It's only us. Second part of that is rename me as your brother or sister. If I'm in your out group, then I want to encourage you to look at me as a brother. If I'm in your in group, then look at someone else who's in your out group as your brother. First John says, whoever claims to love God yet hates his brother or sister is a liar. For whoever does not love their brother or sister who they have seen cannot love God who they have not seen. So how could a Christian, it's pretty obvious that the Bible wants us to look at everybody as our brother or sister. How could a Christian have someone who's in their out group? It's easy. We don't call them our brother or sister. We name them something else. We don't call them family. We say those people. Those immigrants, those white people, those black people, those brown people, those Republicans, those Democrats, those Arabs, those Somalis. When I give someone a label, I give myself permission not to love them. That was good, Angel. Say, okay, I will. <laughs> Anytime we give someone a label, we're giving ourselves an out. We're giving ourselves permission not to love them. Oh, I mean, I love everybody. Except those people. You know, like those Raiders fans? Like, we don't love them, right? <laughs> like, anytime we do that, we give ourselves the out. So I want to encourage you. Next part, give brother love to your out group. We love our brother differently than we love other people. And I want to encourage you to your out group, give that same love that you would give your brother. I call this being my brother's keeper. I'm the character coach for Greeley West High School football. What that means is... Uh, I'm not, they can't call me the chaplain because it's a public school. So once a week, we get about 70 boys. We bring them to our church, and we feed them dinner. I don't know if you've ever watched 70 football players eat. <laughs> We're going to take up an offering right now for that. <laughs> Those boys can eat. And then for about 10 minutes... Every week I talk to them about being good men and about having character. And I talk to them you know, about how to treat a woman, teach them how to shake hands like men. Uh, the, the first week, I've been doing this for four years, and the first week I always tell them this same story. I say there were two brothers. Their names are Cain and Abel. And Cain murders his brother Abel. And God comes looking for them both. And this is what the Bible says. Genesis chapter 4. The Lord said to Cain, where is your brother Abel? I don't know, he replied. Am I my brother's keeper? It's a rhetorical question he's asking God back, and I, I submit to you today that the answer to that is, yes, I am. To everybody around me, I am my brother's keeper. So to the boys, every week we pray in the locker room before the game, 
and we, we all get around and we pray. And there are some people that say God's not allowed in schools. That is not true. The gospel of Jesus Christ is alive and well in our schools through our teachers, through our students. Jesus is in the schools. And so I pray with the boys every week, and I ask them this question before we pray. I say, am I my brother's keeper? Let me show you what they respond. Am I my brother's keeper? Yes, I am. Lord, tonight we ask you that you would help us. You know why I'm doing that? Not just to get goosebumps, although it gives me goosebumps every time I'm in there. Yes, I am. Oh, okay. The reason I do that is because on our football team, there is just about every shade of skin represented that's in our schools. There are 70 different languages spoken in Greeley schools, by the way. There's a lot of diversity there. And those boys are all represented on our team. And so I want our boys to look at each other and to say, I don't care what this guy looks like, where he's from, who his parents are. Maybe he's been raised by both parents or one parent or his grandparents or an uncle or an aunt. Maybe he's a foster kid. Maybe he's adopted. Maybe he has same-sex parents. I don't care who he's going to vote for one day or how much money he has. I am my brother's keeper. I'm going to take care of this guy. And those guys are a unit. We're going to the playoffs next week. I'd appreciate your prayers. All right? <laughs> but if those boys... If those boys can do that for a football game, how much more for the, that the body of Christ could do? The Bible says that the fields are white for the harvest. There are people who are looking to be loved and accepted. What if there was a church that looked out and said, outside of these walls, I am my brother's keeper. I'm going to take care of this guy. I'm going to love this person with the love of Christ. I will be this guy's keeper. I'm going to take care of him. I submit to you that if that happened, that there would not be enough chairs in this place to hold all of the people that are desperately looking for that kind of love. Thank you. Yeah, that was all right. Let me finish with this. The last thought is give your heart to those that are not like you. This man is named Rod Carew. He's a professional baseball player born and raised in Panama. He had 3,000 hits in his career. 18 times he was voted an all-star. When he was 71 years old, he had a heart attack. He needed a heart transplant. This young man is named Conrad. When he was 10 years old, he met Rod Carew. Went, went, got an autograph from him, went home and told his mom, I met my idol, Rod Carew. When I grow up, I'm going to be a professional athlete. And he did. He played football at Stanford, was a tight end in the NFL for many years. When he was 29 years old, he had a brain aneurysm, and he passed away. And his family made the very difficult decision. They donated his organs, and Rod Carew got Conrad's heart. After he was all healed up, Rod called Conrad's mom, and he said, would you like to hear your son's heart beat again? This is a picture of Conrad's mom listening to Conrad's heart beat in Rod Carew's chest. The question I have for you is how could the heart of a young white man beat in the chest of a Panamanian black man if we are all so different? The truth of the matter is we are not different. You know that we are 99.4% genetically identical to each other? We are brothers. And I, I encourage you, would you consider being your brother's keeper? Would you recognize the image of God that is present in every person you encounter? Now, if I know anything about how God works, I know that with a message like this, he's going to give each of us a chance to respond to this message, not here in prayer, although we are going to pray, but this week, somehow, you're going to encounter somebody that is in your outgroup, and you're going to have a decision to make about how you how you deal with them. I know for a fact that's going to happen because we're voting this week and you're on Facebook and you're going to see some people that are in your out group. <laughs> and you're going to have a decision to make about how you treat those people. Those people. <laughs> so we're going to pray that God would give us the strength and the grace to see the people around us in the, with the image of God that he's placed in them. Would you pray with me? Lord, this morning, I pray, Holy Spirit, that this week as we, as we encounter people who are in our out group, that we encounter people that make us uncomfortable, Lord, that we, we, so, we, we feel so unfamiliar with, I pray, Lord, that you would help us to see everyone around us through your eyes and that we would see the image of your, uh, uh, that we would see your image, God, in every person that we encounter this week. I pray that you would fill our hearts with grace and with love. I pray that those that are joining us online, Father, that they would have that ex same experience, that as we scroll through our Facebook timelines, that we wouldn't become upset, 
but that we would see your image in every person on there and that we would pray and love them. Make us more like you, Jesus. That's our prayer. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen.